Bien, eh, vamos a empezar esta segunda jornada del, del seminario. Eh, esta mañana tenemos tres eh, conferencias, tres presentaciones, así que eh, vamos a tratar de adaptarnos lo más posible al, a los tiempos que habíamos eh, pautado. Eh, empezamos esta sesión de la mañana con Acina Zanasiu. Eh, es un placer para nosotros eh, tenerla aquí eh, esta mañana. Eh, Acina es eh, profesora de Antropología Social y Teoría del Género de la Universidad Pantillón de Ciencias Políticas y Sociales en, en Atenas. Sus investigaciones se eh, han centrado ante todo en temas de género, feminismo y teoría queer, así como en cuestiones relativas a la biopolítica, las tecnologías del cuerpo, los afectos, el nacionalismo y la memoria. Entre sus eh, publicaciones destacan eh, Disposition, The Performative in the Political, que coescribió junto a Judith Butler y que apareció en 2013, y que además eh, creo que eh, apunta hacia algunas de las cuestiones que va a desarrollar en la conferencia relativas a este paradigma de la desposesión y a cómo repensar desde él eh, las cuestiones relativas a la utopía y también a, a la imaginación política de una democracia por venir. Así que, eh, sin más, os dejo con Acina. Thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, I must say it was with great pleasure that I received the invitation to contribute to this uh, seminar, and I would like to extend my thanks to all the organizers for putting this event together. And um, I must add here that I'm particularly glad that we gathering here at MACBA, which is a public institution, especially because the thoughts that I'm going to share with you have to do with the relevance of the public uh, to present and future critical projects of world making. Um, here it goes then. Um, Emerging gestures of collective dissent provide the grounds for a critical re-engagement with and a reflective reimagining of alternative political possibilities and temporalities at a moment marked by the neoliberal corporatization of the public, but also the securitization of national space through migrant disposability. Viewed from this perspective, criticality maps out trails of historical and political engagement through which alternative imaginaries are potentially put forward vis-a-vis -vis the uneven globalized distribution of capital, resources and bodies. Criticality involves the eccentric and dispossessed structure of the subject vis-a-vis -vis the epistemologies sorry, vis-a-vis -vis the conditions of its emergence, which has thoroughgoing implications for situated epistemologies and resistances to come. In this context, dispossession is a provisional conceptual matrix intended to account for the question of political time by means of enacting a critique of what is present and mobilizing critical epistemologies and temporalities for defending what is yet to come. I'm going to focus on this Um, figure, actually, uh, defending what is yet to come. Now, in her novel, The Dispossessed, utopian writer Ursula Le Guin writes, you cannot take what you have not given, and you must give yourself. You cannot buy the revolution. You cannot make the revolution. You can only be the revolution. It is in your spirit, or it is nowhere. One of the aspects that I find interesting here is that Leguen links revolution with not so much the idea of the subject as self-contained and self-constituting, but rather as effectively and spiritually or even spectrally constituted beyond oneself, thus enabling a different vision of subjectivity, namely eccentric, uncanny and dispossessed. It has been suggested that the title of Leguen's 1974 utopian science fiction novel that is possessed is a reference to Fyodor Dostoevsky's novel Demons, one popular English language translation of which was titled The Possessed. In that novel that he wrote after his return from Siberian exile, Dostoevsky, a devout Christian who despised atheism, nihilism and the Jews, seeks to capture in a grotesquely satirical and apocalyptically allegorical fashion the political unrest associated with political nihilism in late 1860s Russia, as it is manifested in the subtitle An Ambiguous Utopia, 
of her novel, The Dispossessed, Legan reads Dostoevsky in an ambivalent and somewhat provocative fashion, as when she alludes to the brothers Karamazov and, more specifically, one of its best-known passages, namely, The Legend of the Grand Inquisitor. She writes, I quote, I am offered the Grand Inquisitor's choice. Will you choose freedom without happiness or happiness without freedom? The only answer one can make, I think, is no. End of quote. Echoing Legend's response, fantasy fiction author China Miville writes, I quote, it is, is it better to hope or to despair? Do you want to create better art or do you want a better world in which to create? Are you an artist or an activist? Yes. End of quote. Affirming the political potential of this dispossessed yes and no, I would like to reflect here on a critical engagement with the present that might work to performatively instate another possibility for the question of future communisms in our times. I would like to propose the perspective of defending what is yet to come as a register of resistance to the suspension of possibility lodged within the banalization of TINA, the infamous acronym that stands for the neoliberal doctrine, there is no alternative, and its transformation into a paradigm of governance. Picking up on this symposium's title then, Future Communisms, I propose to ask how utopian desires and designs might inform our critical analytics as a political act and our political struggles as historically embedded contemplative exercises in radical imagination and collective vision. In this moment of ongoing and deepening crisis of racial capitalism and the global rise of far-right wing currents, this question has become more urgent than ever. It has become commonplace for mainstream analysts to argue that any attempt to rethink and change our present social milieu of injustice and inequality is utopian. And by utopian, they mean naive, escapist, impractical, impossible. In a context where utopian thinking itself is in a critical condition, there is an emerging and unending question of how to reclaim a critical sense of the future or futurability in Franco Franco Berardi's terms. This requires new ways of conceiving and engaging with the contingencies of the present amid new and enduring modes of crisis, while squarely deconstructing what Lauren Berland has described as cruel optimism, denote, denoting the attachment to liberal capitalist fantasies of privatized prosperity, which have prevailed since the post-war period in the Euro-American world. Rather than uncritically embracing optimism or pessimism, then, what is needed at this moment, I think, is a critical discourse of temporality whereby political engagement is understood as the performative that reckons indefinitely with the contingent circumstances of the possible. In his brilliant book, Cruising Utopia, Jose Munoz has developed a critical methodology of queerness as horizon and futurity. In the hands of those outside the racial and sexual mainstream, queer futurity is enabled by a world-making capacity through cultural performances that disrupt the normative social scripts of whiteness and heteropatriarchy and open the possibility for other visions and enactments of the world. Queer futurity, in that respect, is a, is a modality of endurance and critique that resists and interrupts the evidentiary logic of straight time by shifting the perspective from the here and now to a then and there. Munoz rearticulates queerness as something not yet here. Queerness, he writes, is, I quote, is that thing that lets us feel that this world is not enough, end of quote. Munoz was interested in this gesture of reorienting the world and opening, opening it up to what is missing by drawing on what Ernst Bloch has termed utopian surplus, whereby the utopian does not refer to a transcendental function, but rather is immanent in the quotidian flows and struggles of the actual existing present. 
At the same time, when enacting a transformative political imagination, it remains excessive to, within and beyond the exigencies and deficiencies of the present. Surplus, in its utopian modality, indicates a non-identical residue that is not captured by the dominant system of the present. Bloch obviously drew his utopian surplus from the notion surplus, surplus value, <clears throat> which has been associated in Marxian political economy with a system of exploitative extraction and appropriation under capital. In this sense, Utopian surplus as a revolutionary not yet that propels history toward a different future takes on distinct connotations today in the face of the far-reaching upward redistribution of resources and power that has been occurring in the context of free market governmentality and the neoliberal attack on democracy and the public. My thoughts here do not mean to present us with a normative road roadmap to break us out of our current political deadlocks. Instead, I hope to gesture towards striking the chord of critical imagination and the incomplete history of the present. In this sense, if we are to think through, with and after the question of communism's future, futures in the present time, within and beyond the present biopolitical order, it must be possible to dislocate the social intelligibility of temporality and speciality that constitutes the here and now, as well as the then, the there and then, at the heart of our critical lexicon. The point for me is to refigure futurity imbued with revolutionary political imagination without reinstalling, reinstalling future as a programmable destination inscribed in the linear, teleological and reproductive matrix of temporality. This is not to give up on futurity, but rather to engage in collective struggles to make life more bearable in the present. Defending what is yet to come is to resist reducing aspirational politics to crafting prescriptions for a complete future and thus reintroducing pragmatic truth-making under the banner of pro promoting progressive utopian politics. Let me refer to uh, Sarah Ahmed's words here, where she says, I quote, I think the struggle for a, for a bearable life is the struggle for queers to have spaces to breathe. With breathe comes imagination. With breathe comes possibility. End of quote. I want to focus on this phrase, with breathe comes possibility. Now, the struggle to make life more bearable in the present involves the work of crafting and re-inhabiting heterotopias, that is, in quiet places and times from where to engage again and again in collective practices of challenging normative configurations, of countering institutionalized injustice, and of instituting in different, more just and equal ways. It involves projects of interrupting and disrupting the status quo through quotidian ways of world making. Failure, defeat, and disappointment are not removed from such modalities of critical possibility and are not void of political poten potentiality for the present and the future. Thus understood, the struggle to make life more bearable in the present involves a politics of defending public spaces and institutions from the calculus of neoliberal dispossession. Dispossession in this context is intended to highlight the encroaching privatization and decimation of public spaces, deepened disparities, disposable labor, and the biopolitical economization of life in the present conjuncture of crisis governmentality. More broadly, as we try to show in our co-authored book with Judith Butler, it is an apparatus of collective critical engagement with the historically shifting and enduring conditions of racial, gendered, and economic modalities of property and properness at play in intertwined histories of colonialism, capitalism, and heteropatriarchy. At the same time, dispossession is integral to processes by which subjects are formed in relation to one another. As it marks the limits of one's own self-sufficiency, it becomes an occasion for the collective political work of thinking and acting critically in times of crisis. In these times of racial capitalism, 
precarity and neo-fascism, when certain collective subjects are exposed to death, poverty and racism, the historical responsibility of critical theory is to reimagine and reactivate an agonistic critique of the present, despite and against the imperialist cartographic reason, as well as the managerial logics and logistics of knowledge production. As I will focus here, so I will focus here on the operatic politics of defending the public university, but first allow me a personal political note. Along with, along with many others of my generation in, in the southeastern European corner of this world where I grew up, I had to go not only to, but also and perhaps more significantly beyond the university to be able to think and study together with others. We had to enact our commitment to the insurgent potential of theory in the streets and other heterotopias of self-knowledge and alternative theory and politics. We saw our critical engagements become bound up with modes of critique beyond and occasionally against the structures of the academy. Against the afterlives of the dictatorship and ongoing forms of authoritarianism that the public university sustained, we had to refuse to learn our lesson of universal values epitomized throughout the guiding paradigms of Eurocentric humanism, possessive and self-possessive individualism, the nationalist and classicist canon, and anti-communist middle-class professionalization. We had to protest within and against the epistemopolitical premises that founded the university institution in general and the humanities in particular. And we did so finding ourselves enmeshed in the embattled contradictions and complicities of the university. And so affirming the critical embodied situatedness rather than a universal space of the university, I would like to ask how are critical epistemologies conveyed within current epistemic and political exercises in defending the humanities and the public good of education from the neoliberal and neocolonial governmentality? In the context of the current modality of governance, also known as the crisis, the axiomatic logics and logistics of metrics becomes a technique of governmentality. The will to metric power retains an uncanny resonance with Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels' characterization of the bourgeoisie in the Communist Manifesto as that which dissolves everything in, I quote, the icy water of egotistical calculation. Metrics now authenticates institutions, subjectivities, dispositions, and one's sense of worth as it attests to self-realization, self-responsibility, according to a pervasive market value. Against this background, I would like to ask how a politics of the incalculable might be mobilized as a critique of managerial and marketized calculation, and how it might become an occasion for rethinking critique in the era of late liberal and racial capitalism. Now, um, let me um, try to uh, present my argument in a nutshell here, if this is possible. Um, I would like to dwell on the question of how to defend the public, how to defend, let's say, the public university and the humanities from this calculative reason of austerity uh, and, and institutional cutbacks, and yet remain attuned to the critique of institutionalized universalist humanism. In order to reckon with the attack on the humanities through the perspective of a left-wing feminist and decolonial theoretical critique of humanism, I would like to caution against positing the humanities as a singular and homogeneously endangered institution and suggest, instead, possible ways of accounting for multiple, variously situated, conflicting humanities, to use Paul Gilroy's and, and uh, Rosie Braidotti's term. The field of the humanities is contested and conflictual and thus not defendable as such. What is at stake is how one positions herself within the field of power relations and contestations that the humanities are. The radical epistemologies of feminist, queer, anti-racist, post-colonial and decolonial studies in their transdisciplinary assemblages have long challenged the ontological grounds of the humanist model of humanities. 
Such critical analytics have incited us to envision the humanities beyond the epistemic privilege of man, which has rendered other ways of living and thinking unthinkable and impossible. Alternative humanities provide pathways into the project of reimagining the terms of the human and humanities from the unsettled historical positioning of what Trin Minha has called inappropriate slash the inappropriated others. To put this as clearly as possible then, defending the humanities does not warrant the restoration of the universal man of the liberal humanist canon. It does not warrant taxonomic figurations that fix and essentialize difference within the epistemic regime of colonial capitalism. The task before us becomes then how to fight for the survival of plural, differential and diffracted, inappropriate and inappropriated humanities in ways that do not sacrifice their dissident potential and do not affirm corporative processes. Hinging on histories of critical epistemologies then, how are we to mobilize an agonistic position of institutional eccentricity to invoke Homi Baba's term, in order to shift from both institutionalization and anti-institutionalism toward engaging in creative acts of instituting differently. How can we rethink the political implications of such ambivalent, unsettled, and indeed conflictual belonging for the purposes of working for a livable present? It remains to be seen in what ways we might rethink the public institution beyond incorporization and normalization. But I think we need to no longer conceive of institutions as fixed, unitary, and localizable entities inside of which we find ourselves, but also as those discursive and affective formations that are inside of us, as it were, constantly articulated through us, embodied and performed by us. Instead of the structural registers of interiority versus exteriority vis-à-vis -vis the institution, however, we might want to think through a transperformative modality of engagement that crosses through the institution, right? Crosses through. I'm talking about, about being situated crosswise instead of uh, sit being situated either inside or outside. Uh, an engagement, that is, that crosses through the institution of the university and its universal claims to truth. Mobilizing the tension between defending and unsettling what is, I would like to think of these two modalities together, right? Defending and unsettling at the same time as an inextricable relationship. In this framework, defending, especially when what is to be defended emerges as a threatened uh, uh, as, as threatened by neoliberalism or fascism, actually, does not become a justification for conserving, safekeeping, and further monumentalizing what is. It does not become a justification for uncritically reinstating the university's narcissistic monopoly on the production of knowledge. This mode of defending the institution does not become a justification for not imagining differently, for not instituting otherwise. It rather commands a break with the snares of institutionalization and the microphysics of power that lets the institution become totalizing and the left become defensive and backward looking. Rather than adherence to a universal moral imperative, defending here involves the agonistic political imaginary and work on what is not yet, that is, what is always already underway in the sense of overlooked, marginalized, and occasionally fugitive. This non-eventful form of eventfulness is only ever hereish, to use Beth Povinelli's term. In this modality of defending public institutions from corporatization, at work is a form of institutional dispossession, again to use uh, Paul Giroy's and Rosie Braidotti's uh, terms. Um, okay. 
But how might it be possible for subjects who are produced by and within certain instituted regimes of subjectification to engage in acts and arts of imagining a different future, despite and against the doctrine of Tina, there is no alternative, which affirms the axiomatic inevitability of global capitalism and precludes the possibility of alternative sociopolitical becomings. Now, um, maybe this, this question uh, requires, if we, if we try to respond to this question, we're required to uh, think uh, or to come up with a new thinking of the possible um, and uh, this is actually my wager here. Um, now, um, in an era of thoroughgoing crisis, crisis management that, wear, that wears out not only bodies and minds, but also the very, the very capacity to imagine and institute otherwise, public institutions, as we know, are considered uh, unaffordable and redundant by market standards. As public institutions are privatized or subcontracted by governments to private agents, the common perception of the neoliberal, neoliberal right posits that defunding the institutions allows the fittest to excel by means of entrepreneurial self-sufficiency and self-management. But what complicates our critical analytics here under current conditions of intensifying differential precarity is that institutions do not simply sustain our endurance, but rather, or also, are actively implicated in sustaining long-term inequality and normalization. So the question becomes, as we defend public institutions, for those of us who are interested in defending public institutions, from the dispossessive calculus of crisis, how is our critique not absorbed by the violent terms of social intelligibility that the institutionalization of late liberal rationality works to tacitly naturalize and moralize? And also, to put it differently, how does our critical analytics survive institutionalization? My goal, however, is not to solve the, the paradox of defending, but rather to grasp the performative temporality of its potentiality in a specific historical context. I would like to propose that what is dispossessed when public institutions are corporatized is not simply the practices, venues, and even the affective registers attached to them, but also, importantly, the very conditions of possibility for their transformation. In losing a public institution, we lose the possibility of collective mobilization in response to what interminably remains to be resisted, reinvented, and reinstituted. In his work on the question of the institution, Foucault has explored how certain forms of historical rationality have been the conditions of possibility for certain institutions. According to Foucault, power cannot be localized within institutions and is not subsumed by them. At the same time, institutions are imbued with power relations. In Foucault's words, power is not an institution and not a structure neither is it a certain strength we are endowed with. It is the name that one attributes to a complex strategic situation in a particular society." End of quote. Governmentality, as we know, is Foucault's uh, term for how institutions come to be instituted through producing embodied subjects as governable and even more significant, significantly, as self-governing. And so the theoretical and political dilemma that I share with you here is this. Institutions, with all their class, racial, ethnic, and gendered inflections, determine livability by compromising or negating the sustainability of certain modes of life. And they often do so while upholding the capitalist biopolitical genealogy of care, 
protection and social security as socially ordained virtues historically associated with a privatized middle class liberal morality. To put it bluntly, institutions sustain us and wipe us out at the same time. Making live and letting die are put to work in a complex entanglement. Right, so what is to be done then? Right, Lenin's burning question. I think this double bind compels us, sorry, this double bind compels an ambivalent positionality of with, within, and against. That is a spectral political location of both proximity and distance, which would allow us to deauthorize the institutions normalizing violence while at the same time resisting the, the rationality that depletes non market institutions. This is particularly crucial as the destruction of non market institutions is often paired with the inauguration of new, non-instituted institutions that are totally impervious to any kind of democratic accountability. The so-called Eurogroup is a notorious example here, right? We have been used to this as though the Eurogroup is a kind of, you know, elected, accountable institution. No, sorry, I mean, this is nothing like that. In other words, what seems to be at stake is a critical redefinition of the institution as a topos of long-term interpolation, and at the same time as a constellation of uneasy interiority and uncanny occupation. This requires that we critically question the classical disjunctive mode that often marks the language and imagination of political contestation in our times, namely the binarism between either working within immanent conditions or from a presum presumptively pure outside. In different but inter interrelated contexts of the present conditions, such as the Occupy movements, and also the challenge posed by the possibility of forming left governments in Europe. The enactment of the institution has become a site of intense collective reflection on how to institute otherwise by unworking formal institutions under conditions of impossibility. In both these contexts, occupying an institution cannot be reduced to simply being part of the institution or becoming like the institution, or even occupying the position of its internal token of difference. Occupying does not denote a heroic and miraculous seizing of state power or state institutions as such. But neither is it about assuming a pure, non-institutional and anti-institutional form of action. From this angle, occupying might be seen as a possible way out of the strict demarcation between horizontal and vertical modes of political action and towards more inquate, plastic and transversal forms and vocabularies of political subjectivity. Now, in its fight against neoliberal deinstitutionalization, the critical left rightly assumes the position of defending public institutions while criticizing their long-term normative unreliability or complicity with state violence. The Academics for Peace call to boycott the Turkish higher education system is a suggestive example here. But as I tried to unravel before, the modality of defending takes the form of safeguarding the object of one's critique by defending not only what already exists, but also, and even more significantly, what is to be reclaimed and what is to be instituted anew. In this sense, performing the institution in a counter-institutional way means, first of all, resisting its closure. Here, the word closure signifies the neoliberal impulse not only to downsize and outsource uh, which forces, uh, sorry, not the neoliberal impulse not only to downsize and out outsource, which forces public institutions to close down, literally, but also to divest them of the very possibility to serve, even unwittingly, as sites of unconditional dissent. 
Now, the ambivalent mode of engaging with the institution by not being at home in institutions and not being at home with oneself in institutions indicates a performative reconfiguration of institutions as indeterminate sites of conflict and struggle. How do we critically engage the way in which institutions institute then? And how can institutions be instituted differently? I would argue that the critical performativity of working with, within the institution against the logics of institutionalization involves a twofold move. On the one hand, acting here and now as if it were possible, to use Derrida's words, to keep the question of the institution open as an interminably operatic call for another politics that simultaneously performs and resists the institution. And on the other hand, posing again and again the question that Hannah Arendt was reported to have once asked, what will we lose if we win? Now, let me try to give an example Finally, uh, the forms of resistance and political activism that have recently emerged in and around the university demand uh, and enact the, the reallocation of institutional resources in the wake of neoliberal dispossession. One of these activist forms, the book block, um, can we have the first image please? Uh, one of these activist forms, the so-called book block, attempted to defend and open up the space of the university. In this street action, protesters marched through the streets of various European cities wearing mock books as shields in defense of public universities and libraries, and against tuition increases that exclude disenfranchised students from higher, higher education. I think a particular uh, image of the book block captures the spirit of this street performance, depicting a policeman raising his baton against the protester who carries a sign of Derrida's book, Spectres of Marx. Thus, chasing the specters of Marx, the figure of the policeman unwittingly re-embodied the Derridian claim that the specters of Marx and Marxism are indeed disturbingly undead by taking to the streets and thus repositioning their bodies in the public space, these academic workers, non-tenured faculty and indebted students came together to defend the unconditionality of the university against neoliberal attempts to expropriate it. There is no doubt that universities have always been places of entrenched authority, differential privilege, devalued labor and disciplinary knowledge production, organized around some theological political form of sovereignty, such as God, the law, the state, the empire, or private capital. But the question is, what performative powers can be mobilized in this activism to lay claim to alternative and plural humanities, where the term humanities indicates both a critical alternative to high culture and a critique of normative configurations of what counts as human. If the key trope of the book block is rendering written texts publicly accessible, would it allow us to resituate the question of textuality beyond the typographic and bibliophilic protocols of the archive? What kind of critical textualities might emerge from this affective and embodied practices to reload the archive of the humanities. Um, and I think the key trope of this book, of the, of the book block, ambivalently evokes the last scene in François Truffaut's 1966 filmic adaptation of Fahrenheit 451, where a group of people amble through the woods, um, each reciting or becoming a book they have learned by heart in order to keep it alive. Based on the 1953 futuristic novel by Ray Bradbury, the film takes place in a hypothetical totalitarian society where the government seeks out and destroys all literature. Affected by an, an encounter with a young dissident schoolteacher who was fired for her unorthodox 
teaching methods uh, because she engaged her students uh, in discussion and dialogue instead of making them recite. Uh, one of the firemen, uh, that is a member of the brigade whose, whose duty is to locate and burn all books, begins to hide books in, this, in his house and read them. The fireman becomes a convert to reading and a book collector and eventually joins the book people, a clandestine group of fugitives, each of whom has selected and memorized the book in order to save it from the ashes. Just let me give you some idea here. But I would like to um, insist uh, on my line of questioning, how does the con conservation of the written word become inadvertently engaged in the authorization of regulatory discursive inheritances? Uh, the political performativity through which books are re-embodied and reactivated resonates with Derrida's question, what about the book to come? whereby the to come is linked to spectrality, the figure of the event, the unanticipated coming of the other, and the coming of the impossible as a condition of the possible. The, the, the l'avenir, what, what Derrida calls the l'avenir of books coming out of the libraries and taking to the streets, invokes his characterization uh, of the space of literature as not only that of an instituted fiction, but also a fictive institution. It is an institution, he writes, which tends to overflow the institution. If here Derrida uh, engages with literature as a counter in institution, in another text he has addressed the antinomy inherent in the counter of counter institution. The word counter uh, can equally and at the same time mark both opposition, contradiction, and proximity near contact. contact. The counter institution of the book block, where counter signifies the dialectic of opposition and proximity, opposes the dispossession of the humanities while also reinstituting a space where such dispossessions can count as losses. See, we have nothing to lose but our humanities. Um, as an attempt to defend, uh, I'm very close to finishing here, as, as an attempt to defend, open up and proliferate the space of public education against the calculability of bodies and resources, the book block street performance resonated with yet another collective action that defended a public institution while mobilizing processes of embodied public dissent. At the Istanbul Gezi Park occupation of spring, of spring 2013, what began as a protest against plans to remove Taksim Gezi Park um, turned into an uprising against authoritarianism, involving a wide spectrum of protest strategies, including the standing reading protest in which hundreds of people stood in public spaces reading literature, political philosophy, or daily newspapers. Their action asked, what is proper to public space in view of the expropriation of public assets and its redistributive effects? And what resistances to come haunt the social dislocation prompted by this public space's commodification? It is precisely this collective critical intensity, dislodged from any heroic and teleological connotations, that creates space for the eventness of non-corporate, non-commodified institutions in the face of losing one's means of livelihood, home, health care, or public education. This is the condition of possibility that allows people, books, and also the spirit of collective agonism in the uncanny form of the specters of Marx to take to the streets. Thank you for your patience and attention. Pues eh, muchísimas gracias a Cina por la por la conferencia que creo que nos ha dejado 
muchas cosas para, para pensar. Eh, yo particularmente te lo quería agradecer porque creo que es sumamente útil para quienes nos pensamos también críticamente ¿no? al interior de las instituciones académicas, particularmente en el sur de Europa. Escuchándote me han dado muchas ganas de traducir tu conferencia y poder socializarla con mis compañeros y alguna camarada de departamento, porque creo que es muy, nece muy necesario uh, digamos, instalar en las instituciones públicas esta reflexión que tú has, has realizado. Así que te, te quería dar las gracias y, uh, y bueno, abrir el turno de, de preguntas. Eh, bueno, buen día Atena, eh, en la misma línea que Jaime agradecerte la conferencia que ha sido como muy estimulante eh, para pensar y quería quería preguntarte sobre eh, <coughs> qué, qué nuevos modos de activismo eh, han emergido en particularmente en Grecia, que es un territorio tan eh, humillado, sobre todo a partir de 2015, con, con la defección de Siriza. Eh, ¿qué, ¿Qué nuevos modos de activismo has visto que, que emergen allí, donde el Estado prácticamente se posiciona en contra de cualquier activismo? ¿no? Sí, ¿Hay alguna pregunta más que...? Podamos. Eh... Sí, gracias. Thank you, Athena. Uh, I think it's. <laughs> well, I, I will try to formulate in English so you don't have to put that on. Okay, thank you. I'm fine, though. Uh, I think it's somehow related with previous questions. And, and mine is that is it up to academia uh, to find this space of resistance that you suggested at the end of your conference about bringing. Marks to the street uh, by means of book. Uh, don't you think that there is also the possibility that uh, non-institutionalized, uh, uh, let's say, initiatives triggered by non-academic people can um, make this happen? See, um Sí, eh, eh, por curiosidad también y en la línea de lo que preguntaban eh, los dos compañeros, eh, quisiera saber eh, cuál está siendo la política concreta de Sirisa en relación a, a la universidad. Sorry, uh, I Can you repeat it? Sorry, sí, I missed the first sí, part. sí. No, eh, decía que en relación a las uh, cuestiones que han planteado los, los dos compañeros, eh, quería preguntarte, eh, más allá, digamos, del ahogo financiero que experimentan las políticas públicas en Grecia, uh, si uh, de alguna manera se está eh, favoreciendo desde, desde el gobierno generar algún tipo de dinámicas que puedan dar, digamos, espacio a... A, a tu propuesta, la propuesta que nos has traído hoy y si eso está, digamos, eh, impulsando eh, ¿no? eh, la resistencia al interior de instituciones académicas en, en Grecia actualmente. No, o sea, of, of kind of... si al menos, digamos, está facilitando eh, los espacios para que esas dinámicas se den, más allá de que no pueda quizás eh, mm. respaldarlas financieramente, eso quiero decir. Mm. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. This was to be expected, <laughs> having questions about Syriza and, uh, no, they're, you're very welcome, you know, ask these questions. Uh, uh, although it's, it's, it's hard, it's hard for me because uh, um, I think we are in a very uh, complicated juncture of, um, you know, post-defeat period. Um, although I want to insist that I don't endorse Uh, approaches which seek to expel the element of defeat from the history of the left. 
Um, I think this is completely undialectical and anti-comrade, I think. Uh, there's, no, there's no question that... Um, uh, let me start from the, you know, the bad news. Um, Syriza suffered uh, a huge defeat uh, on that, in that um, immemorable uh, July 15 night um, when it was, you know, the, the, the Prime Minister uh, was forced to sign the, the memorandum and to comply in a way with Europe's inflexible neoliberal doxa. Um, but many questions emerge from here, uh, in, my, in my view. Uh, first, where was the European left uh, in that night? <laughs> So for me, this is, there's a huge question of how we define uh, solidarity uh, in, a, in, a, in a left way, you know. So um, the, other, the other thing, which for me is, has to do with how we conceive of dialectics, is um, that, and I think this is a very pressing question that we need to uh, ask and try to respond to here, is... Um, we have to wonder what the what Syriza politics has achieved through this defeat. Um, I think that we have to take into consideration that the um, the series the series rise to power, uh, which took place under the banner of you know a more you know wide political agenda of dignity social justice, right? I mean, it didn't, uh, uh, Syriza's rise to power did not happen under the, you know, the banner of a kind of, you know, uh, revolutionary project. Uh, so, um, and which means a lot about the class alliances which brought Syriza to power, right? Um, you know, middle class voted for Syriza, and I can assure you that they voted for Syriza for completely different reasons from let's say, my reasons for voting for Syriza, right? I mean, for example, you know, they didn't like, you know, taxation. And I, I, I do believe in taxation. And I think this is a left pro... I mean, taxation is, is, is important. The thing is that how... The, the question is how taxation can be distributed uh, in a, in a class-biased <laughs> uh, manner in favour of the working class and the lower uh, uh, social stra strata. So... Um, I think that this, this event, the rise to power for Syriza, uh, was, was a momentous political event in itself. Uh, and I think that we have to um, acknowledge this. Um, uh, and I think it was, it was a momentous political event in itself because it, it brought Europe's neoliberal and post-democratic hegemony to critical crisis, because in a way, this event brought politics back to the agenda, mm -hmm. um, which was not something to be underplayed and, and downplayed and undervalued, I think. Um, now, it's true that Syriza was defeated uh, in terms of signing the memorandum. Uh, it was forced to comply, in a, in the, in a sense, with, with um, um, you know, the austerity agenda of, of uh, Europe. But I think at the same time, um, political disagreement, political dissensus has re-entered uh, Europe's protected and remote rooms of, of power. <coughs> uh, now, whether or not the radical, I mean, the... How, I don't know, I mean, whatever, I, I was about to say the radical democratic project. It's hard to describe it, but anyway, uh, whether or not the project of Syriza will be forced to uh, failure at the end, um, I think is still to be seen. And I think it has to do with how we, mm -hmm. with all the you know, trepidations that haunt this we here, mm -hmm. uh, can embody this, this challenge and, and do something with this defeat, despite the de debilitating logic of the defeat. Because let's face it, I mean, the history of the left is a, is a, is a history of defeats, because, you know, there's a, I mean, the, the, the balance of power, I mean, that's what 
any Marxist should know. I mean, right? I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a certain balance of power, and fighting uh, with this balance of power is something that really is always yet to come. You know, you, you never know in a programmable way how this will um, uh, come up. Uh, but I think um, uh, the guiding force of this uh, project had to do with, uh, uh, with making people's lives more livable uh, in the present in the name of a better future, right? So uh, this is, I think, still to be seen. And uh, uh, in terms of activism, though, uh, to, to focus more specifically to, uh, on, the, on the first question, in terms of activism, uh, I think this is, this is v uh, really something uh, worrisome for me, that um, activism seems to be uh, diminished, um, uh, but at the same time, we see different and multiple projects of, of uh, activism emerging every day. For example, uh, the, the, the um, um, refugee solidarity projects are really thriving at this point in, in Greece, and I think this is something very, very important, um, uh, especially if we think, if we uh, have in mind that, um, um, uh, you know, fascism is, is a huge problem right now in, in Europe, and it's actually, it works in tandem with neoliberalism in very uh, particular ways, right? I mean, these logics and logistics of rendering people disposable uh, permeates both the neoliberal and the fascist uh, project. Uh, so I think the, the refugee um, um, uh, solidarity is something very important because it really troubles uh, the, the false <coughs> universalism of European democracy uh, and actually European nationalism because we have, we have to remember that we have this too. Uh, for example, Pegida, for example, is a, it's, mm. a very, it's, a, it's a very good example of um, um, European nationalism. So, um, but in terms of activism, I would like to, to um, uh, add here that when it comes to activism, again, uh, we have to think a little bit more about how we define activism. Uh, when it comes to bodies on the streets, for mm. example, uh, I think that it's critical we bear in mind that it's not only the left uh, mm. that is taking to the streets today in Europe, but also occasionally the, the, the right and even the far right, mm. uh, the neo-Nazi uh, uh, groups and all that. Uh, for example, I mean, in, in Greece and other European contexts that I know of, um, exploiting the erosion of welfare system, uh, members of these uh, extreme right-wing neo-Nazi groups um, uh, organize <coughs> solidarity enterprises. They call it that, right? Solidarity. But of course, they mean solidarity in, in very, you know, in an ethnically exclusive manner. Of course, they organize, for example, Greek only food giveaways or uh, blood donations for just for ethnic Greeks and so on and so forth. And this happens in different European um, uh, contexts. So I think uh, reclaiming the public, the public space, uh, is something that um, uh, brings with it uh, huge challenges uh, of, you know, which have to do with this conflict and, and uh, challenge and so on and so forth. So, so the second question, non-academic uh, uh, institutions, yes, of course, and I think that that's, that's uh, I, I think I insinuated uh, on, in that. Um, the, the, the point here is how to defend the public university without reinstating its monopoly over knowledge production. So yes, I mean, that's, this is the question, how to uh, defend the public university while opening it up mm. to other, you know, non-instituted, unhoused, you know, alternative mm. uh, institutions which um, get formed in the street or, you know, other, in other heterotopias and the book block is just one example, and uh, it's you know it's more spectacular because it has to do with taking to the streets. But of course, we have different you know a multiplicity of different uh, non-instituted institutions. My point is that I wouldn't want to endorse an anti-institutional 
um, perspective when it comes to what it means to defend the public uh, institution, especially because I think that today, under the, you know, I mean, in the context of, of uh, this neoliberal austerity calculus, um, uh, inst public institutions are, you know, the main one of the main targets mm -hmm. of neoliberals, uh, and I know that sometimes, you no. Know, power is threatening to turn us into, you know, backward looking defensive left subjects. But that's why I, I, I do believe that we have to take this occasion, not as, as an occasion to safeguard what already exists, because that because we know that this what the, the already existing is not what we have wished for. I mean, we have struggled uh, <coughs> to change you know, these institutions and open them up to the public in so many different ways. So um, my wager here is to say that uh, this, is, this is a risk. This is a risk for the left to turn into a very, you know, uh, a conservative, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of left which just, which, which just engages in projects of defending the existing status quo. Uh, at the same time, I think that the already existing order of things is somehow always already haunted by our own struggles at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we cannot just dismiss or, you know, uh, let it go, the public institution, because it's, it's us too. I mean, it's, it's, it's what, you know, wider movements have fought for. Uh, but more importantly, I think that we need these institutions, we need this gesture of defending the institutions, these gestures of defending while unsettling, right, mm -hmm. the institutions, uh, as, as, as sites of contestation. In a way, I, I propose uh, that it's important to fight for a site of contestation. It, it's it's a, to fight for our own object of critique, right? So, um, and I think the uh, there's one more question: uh, the extent to which the government facilitates. Um, I think so. Although I don't want to hear like a you know a fervent Caesar supporter, which which I which I am in a way, in, in my critical way, right? Uh, and, you know, again, proximity and distance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I have to say that Greece is one, you know, it's probably the last country in which we have, you know, uh, no fees, uh, no tuition, graduate programs, and even undergrad, I mean, un both undergraduate and graduate programs, gro programs are free of tuition and, and fees. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think this is something. Yeah. Uh, and I think that we have to, we have to cherish this, not, not as, as an object of, you know, a kind of, you know, governmental concession to, our, no, I mean, it's, 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 it's the achievement of our movement. So I think we have to stand by it in a way. Uh, now, there is a huge fight there, of course, at the same time, because the, the, um, the right is really lurking right now. And I mean, these, these are, this, this is their agenda, actually, to privatize everything, to subcontract the public university to private agents. I mean, this is, our, this is their agenda. So the, fi the, the, the conflict is there, the fight is there. So again, the, the challenge of defending while unsettling uh, is there too. And I mean, when we talk about defending at the same time, it's not that we're all the same within the humanities or the universities. I mean, come on, I mean, my, half, half of my colleagues are neoliberals. Uh, but it's, it's important that the government right now uh, seems to be supportive of uh, our struggles to maintain uh, the university as a public institution. And uh, the government recently passed a law which safeguards this, which actually um, disallows, uh, you know, imposing uh, fees and tuition and all that. So I think there is a certain degree of facilitating mm -hmm. um, our challenge of defending the public university. Mm -hmm. uh, 
thank you for the very interesting um, talk. Um, a couple of questions. I'm not sure how way, how well they connect with each other. Um, the one of the things I was interested in is the way at one point in the talk you slipped from saying you went um, the neoliberal conditions, awful neoliberal, and then slipped even fascist now. And so mm. I'm wondering, do we need a different critical apparatus <laughs> or a different set of uh, categories depending on are we fighting neoliberalism or are we fighting fascism? Mm -hmm. Can the same tools and weapons, the same concepts do double duty or do we need different ones? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to, on the to try to push the different one line, I'm going to use the uh, US examples. And I don't know if they're generalizable or not, but maybe they're interesting in figuring out the case. So for um, a US, US example, um, one might say you would fight calculability because neoliberalism relies on calculable measures. However, um, what in a more fascist direction, so um, the US Congress a few years ago made it against the law to collect um, statistics on um, gun deaths. And so now the only statistics on gun deaths are kept by um, a, you know, a nonprofit group, but they don't, they're not official statistics. So we don't have those statistics. Mm -hmm. um, the you know, Trump administration is getting rid of all sorts of you know, um, measuring and, and tracking of environmental um, violations. So here, calcul <laughs> defending calculations, defending the calculable, um, pushing calculability might be important in a struggle against um, you know, the US version of fascism. Mm -hmm. So that's one example. Another one would be um, the understanding, so you, you want to defend the university as a site of contestation. In the US, that is really up for grabs on free speech lines mm -hmm. because really horrible right-wing people um, are being funded by right-wing groups to try to be le get legitimacy by speaking on college campuses. Yes. And so then the divisive um, fight is between some of us on the left who will take a no platform position, right? You can't let them in, you fight against them. And then liberals who are like, no, the university is a site of contestation, everyone should get to speak. So again, here, whether or not one is dealing with fascism or neoliberalism really might make a difference. Um, one last question. Um, you know, you're emphasizing the importance of livability in the presence yet at the same in the present yet at the same time you recognized that um, fascist and far-right elements are also pursuing a politics of livability for some and so it's not clear to me that there is a real politics of livability rather than that livability is a site of political struggle and so you can't just appeal I would think to the livable or to survivable because it's always going to be a question of who and under what conditions and so just to live or survive is never going to be enough and so then the last point is is an opening to the future enough of a defense under current conditions, or do you actually have to give it a positive vision and a positive name? And so as, you know, in the keeping with this um, conference, sorry, communism. I'm going to ask you to repeat oh, the, the last one. Oh, sorry, I So the last, the very last point is, um, under these conditions then, is a um, defense of, of public space or public institutions in terms of, an openness to the future, or in terms of something to come, or a kind of potential that's not yet there, is that enough? Or do we need a more a stronger positive vision, say, of communism, that we name and defend and give it something? Because I, I and obviously I've, I've got a bias here. Good. Thank you. It's a good bias. Mm -hmm. um, okay, it's a lot of things here. Uh, thank you, Jody. These are very. Um, helpful and inspiring. Um, first, calculability. You're absolutely right. Uh, what I meant by calculability here is something very, you know, prosaic in a sense. I meant what, you know, Max Weber describes as the spirit of capitalism, right? The, the, that is the calculative, calculative um, 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 frame of mind, which is at the center, at the heart of capitalism. Uh, that's why I, I use this 
my favorite communist manifesto uh, mm. passage, the, the icy waters of uh, egotistical calculation. Mm. Uh, so the calculation of profit, this is the, the habitus of capitalism uh, in a way. Uh, and actually I think that it's interesting how uh, people like Arjuna Padurai, for example, and others have shown in very persuasive ways, I think, that this frame of mind, this spirit of capitalism, is even more powerful and important sometimes, even more than the arrangement of capitalist um, mechanisms themselves. But you're right, I mean, calculability, again, we have to politicize it. It's not by itself uh, something to be dismissed or... Uh, so that's that's what I, I meant. You know, I meant the, you know the neoliberal metrics, um, the the spirit of capitalism, uh, which reduces everything to the calculation not of everything, I mean, calculation of profit, right? Um, so um, then, uh, same with live. No, your second question is uh, the university free speech. Yes, of course. Uh, again, you're very right. I agree both theoretically and politically with you, but I, I don't mean to present this project of defending as a liberal project. I insist on that. For me, it's not a liberal project. And I, I try to make this very, very explicit. Uh, so I don't mean, you know, that this is an open space. Well, it's not an open space. It's not a free space. It's a space of entrenched authority, power relations. Uh, it's a place of entrenched privilege and exclusions and all that. It sucks. So I'm not, I'm not saying that let's defend something which is, wow, amazing, great. Let's go ahead and love it and embrace it. Not at all. So my, that's why I think that this is a very risky and slippery and complicated uh, suggestion, if I may describe it this way. So it, this is the, how to defend something you don't endorse mm. by itself. But when the neoliberals want to close everything down, we have to do something. We have to have, you know, be, you know uh, in addition to our, to go to your fourth point, in addition and inspired by our long-term, call it whatever, larger uh, political vision, uh, we have to do something in the present. And for me, there, there, is a very, there is an inextricable relationship between you know, fighting this quotidian fight of defending while unsettling, and at the same time, preparing, if you wish, you know, for, for our larger uh, visions. We may call it communism, we may call it Radical. I, I, I don't want to dwell on the terms, although I'm a communist and, you know, this is my uh, political history and I, I wholeheartedly disagree with attempts to, you know, dismiss or misplay or replace the word communism because uh, 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 it's a very... Uh, but I think that communism comes with its own baggage too. So... Again, we have to, there is some work that is required there. Uh, and I dare say that, um, same with democracy. I don't, so that's why I, 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 I do, wouldn't want to prioritize democracy at the expense of communism or vice versa, because I think both genealogies come with their heavy and complicated baggage, and there is work that is required to be done there um, in both directions and for example I think that you know I mean uh, let's take the word democracy again I mean you know th there is no question that democracy democracy is completely and deeply imbricated with capitalism at the same time I think and you might disagree with this one now I think that um, uh, neoliberalism is an attack on democracy at the same time uh, I know that we but, but um, you know, even their own liberal, you know, conservative parliamentary idea of democracy has been under threat. Uh, I mean, you know, for example, you know, Greek history, recent history, you know, the, the, the experts, uh, um, governments, unelected, 
I mean, complete, uh, arbitrary, non-accountable, democratic, in quotation marks, politics. So I think that there is something about democracy that needs and, 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 and it needs to be revolutionized. I think there is some space for re revolutionizing democracy because I think that democracy is both imbricated with capitalism, but it has a revolutionary tradition at the same time. So we might want to reclaim this tradition. At the same time, we have to do something with, uh, you know, the problematic aspects of our communist genealogies. You know, Stalinist genealogies. I mean, I, I'm, I, for me, this is very important at the same time. Um, so, so uh, defending the university, the public university, the public institution as a site of contestation is not a liberal project and we, we have to make sure not to let it be a project of liberalism and glorifying free speech. We have to make sure these guys are not allowed to come and speak in the name of free speech in our universities. We have to struggle, I mean, we have to do something with our bodies. We have to face state, I mean, violence, riot police, whatever. We have to inhale, you know, the, the, the whatever, the, what's the called, the gas, uh, yeah, tear gas. So that's, that's the way it works, I think. Um, and we have maybe, we want to use some democratic uh, weapons to counter this rhetoric of free speech. We might want to deploy, for example, you know, a discourse of hate speech and say, oh, well, there's a limit to your free speech. Hate speech is, you know, so I mean, we, different, different methodologies and, and ideas and, and more significantly different embodied practices of defending uh, what is there to be reclaimed and not what is there to be cherished as it is. Um, Again, with, with livability, I totally agree with you, totally, and I think it's very uh, problematic to reduce livability to a certain, I don't know, I mean, you know, universal uh, project of survival in the name of humanity. <laughs> uh, totally disagree with that. I think that livability is a term which uh, begs for politicization. I mean, we have to politicize. I mean, in the sense that um, it's 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 something that it's unequally distributed uh, across, you know, class, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, and so on and so forth. So uh, yes, of course, uh, it must be something, of course, more than survival. Uh, so I, I would be suspicious, as you are, with with uh, reducing livability to projects, universal projects of survival. Um, and then, uh, do we need uh, a more positive vision? Yes, I think we do. I, I answered that in a way. Um, because you, you use the word positive, though, I want to say something. I'm really, I'm a little hesitant towards um, um, rehearsing these usual binaries between affirmative politics and critical politics or deconstructive politics. I think we need more at the same time. Um, uh, I don't know, for example, I, I, what comes to mind now is uh, this uh, interesting, I'm not, I'm not wholeheartedly in agreement with that, Eve Sedgwick's um, distinction between reparative critique and paranoid critique. So I think, well, reparative critique is, is a site where this binary between positive and negative is somehow exceeded and surpassed and it's producing something else. Um, but we do need this horizon of futurity. I totally agree with you. My, my uh, thing here is that we, we shouldn't let this, this, this horizon of futurity uh, keep us from from working in the present right and right now, uh, especially because the 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 there the there and then uh, is somehow prefigured by what we do now. Right. So we have to prefigure in the here and now what is yet to come for us for for the left. You know. Uh, either by solidarity projects, you know, whatever. I mean, by working in the quotidian flows of uh, <laughs> struggle and conflicts.
too much. No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, creo que estamos sobre la hora. Eh, ah, una pregunta más. Sí, una pregunta más. Gracias, Azena, por la, la eh, charla. Eh, yo quisiera preguntarte en términos de buscar estas, oh, sorry, sorry. nuestras propias sorry. armas. I have to change the channel. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Is it two? It's two. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm fine. Thank you. Eh, Gracias, uh, primero que nada. Y eh, en términos de encontrar nuestras propias armas para pelear eh, por nuestras instituciones, especialmente a mí me interesa por la educación pública, eh, ¿en, qué, ¿en qué lugar eh, ubicas eh, esta pelea? Con, digo, estamos en, en, en un museo y las, digamos, eh, esta batalla en, en términos de de trabajar con la imaginación política, con herramientas de las prácticas artísticas. ¿Qué piensas? ¿Qué, qué, ¿Tú cómo lo has visto en el contexto en, en Atenas? Y si, digamos, como desde estas herramientas, ¿qué, qué futuro nos, nos eh, podemos encontrar? ¿no? O si más bien, o podemos mezclarlo entre poner nuestros cuerpos, el gas, pero, pero además eh, lo poético. ¿Dónde están estos elementos? ¿Cómo los miras? Gracias. Thank you. That's a that's a great question. Um, I don't know if I'm the most appropriate person to to answer it, although I'm really interested in. Uh, art projects that have been emerging, especially during the so-called the crisis uh, period. Um, and I think um, art is very, very uh, uh, important when it comes to uh, this, um, the way in which we conceptualize what is politically possible. Uh, and I think it's not, it's not uh, you know, accidental, this, this uh, infamous Uh, dictum politics is the art of the possible, uh, uh, first, first um, articulated by Germany's Iron Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. Uh, but then it was, it was taken up by many people, including you know, Weber and all the you know, different people, uh, either as a defense of impossibility, uh, that is in the, f in the form of a cynical anti-utopianism, um, or to, an, to a different uh, direction. Uh, but I'm sure that you mean art in more um, literal sense. And um, in, since you asked about Athens, I have to say that um, alternative artistic projects are really thriving right now in, in Athens, in Greece in general. Um, and I think in, in different Southern European contexts too at the same time. Uh, for example, I'm involved in a, in, in a very interesting project of theater of documentation. Um, uh, and um, for example, this, this, this group of people have done a wonderful job in um, presenting a theater which uh, plays the role of a testimony uh, in a context of a case of pushback, refugee <laughs> pushback. Um, and they have done wonderful research and um, so theater of documentation and other uh, art projects are very, very, um, very much thriving right now. Um, again, uh, defending the museum, um, again, I think that the museum is um, a place which is entrenched really with, you know, authority and classicism and uh, all kinds of humanist canons and all that, and, and colonial and uh, uh, capitalist, uh, market-oriented uh, art and all that. Uh, so that's why I, I would insist on that, that we have to make sure that uh, in our struggle we don't work even unwittingly to further monumentalize the museum or the, the art institution. 
Uh, so again, the question is how to inhabit the, the, the museum while deconstructing its premises, its, its genealogical and historical premises. Um, but again, we have to make sure that our politics does not uh, end up in a kind of regressive politics of defending the, the, the existing status quo. Um, but art is very important, you're right, and uh, it's, a, it's a very complicated uh, question, this one. But I, I, I think that art is very crucial to our political imagination in general. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, this uh, uh, very, one, very interesting public discussion between Adorno and uh, Ernst Bloch in 1964, uh, where um, they both talked about their uh, theories on utopia, um, and uh, Bloch uh, recalled um, uh, Bertolt Brecht's phrase, uh, which was the, fam the famous uh, phrase, something is missing in mahogany. It was a, it was a phrase from um, uh, Brecht's city of mahogany. And mahogany, as we know, was supposed to be a capitalist paradise. Uh, so Bloch recalled this phrase, this phrase from a, theat from a theatrical piece, right? Uh, something is missing in order to develop his ideas on, on utopia. And what was interesting was that Adorno was actually critical of Bloch uh, in terms of what he understood, what Adorno understood as, a, as a, an overly optimistic um, approach to uh, history of, transfer, of social transformation and so on and so forth. So uh, yeah, I mean, art in general is very crucial to uh, projects of activating and reactivating political imagination, especially when um, uh, Political imagination cannot be captured by very, you know, prescriptive and very um, um, uh, fixed roadmaps. We don't need roadmaps. We mm -hmm. we need uh, these kinds of arts and acts of reimagining our present and future. I think. So thank you a lot. And uh, thank, you. A, thank you. Thank you. Vamos a hacer un pequeño descanso de cinco minutos y continuamos con, con María Eugenia Rodríguez Palo.